Hey, before we jump in, I just had a question. Did any of you guys mm -hmm. do any of the lab yet for this chapter seven? I, I not, not yet. I just read through it. Okay. Well, I just started playing with it. I'm, I, and uh, I just don't fully understand the formula. Uh, like for swans well you know when you put in a formula it's like this it says like you know to, if you want to do like h to the nth power i have to put like an i around it to complete so it doesn't interpret it as a special way but what is that special uh, way could you share your screen you sharing what you're uh but i just or like, uh, yeah or, or share the syntax you're talking about or... yeah let me just figure out where my here it is. I think I know what you're talking about, but oh. I need to share Here, I'll share this section that I'm looking at. Make that bigger. So right here it says, so you can do this to make a pun, rather than just do raw equals true, you can do this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The eyes. And it says the I wrapper function protects the A squared because this symbol has special meaning. And I'm just like, what is the special meaning? <laughs> Oh, I tried just doing it without the wrapper, and it just seemed to do a linear fit. It didn't seem to do anything interesting at all. So I'm not sure what the mm. special meaning is. But I looked in the document. I, I mean, if you knew off the top of your head, otherwise I'll just, just dig through the documentation. But yeah, I'm not sure. Mm. Uh, just Google it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was, I was doing. Okay, let's see. Uh, it's it's a shorthand for interaction. So it's interaction ah. between the, that variable and itself, I guess. Right, uh, which, which is nothing then. Okay, I get it. Now I know I just basically doesn't do anything. <laughs> Weird, huh? I think. Yeah, that's that's what that's a stack overflow. So it's, Okay, I didn't want to dive derail too much. I just thought maybe if you knew how to talk, talk but nice. Mm -hmm. I will dig into that. But yeah, it looks like it It only makes sense if you have like multiple different things like A plus B, caret A plus B will generate all the interactions. And Oh, I see what you mean. Like like all of them grouped in, yeah. like all the variables like added together, or right. additively interacted or something. Okay. Interesting. Crossings, that's what they call it. Crossings up to a specific degree. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. All Sorry, right, now cool. I got stuck on that. Um, I get what it's saying. The carrot symbol has special meaning and formulas meaning these regression formulas or overall in Yeah. Art? Well, the form these regression, these formula things are used all over the place, right? But mainly regression, I guess. Okay, okay. I don't know. That's one of the things I've seen. But... Huh. Yeah, I'll, I'll put this uh, in my chat. Oh, okay, cool. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, I guess we could get started. Um, cool. um, okay. Um, so yeah, so I thought this is a pretty interesting chapter. Um, I had like gone through tutorial on GAMS before. Um, oh, let me actually share my knitted version because I added a couple of resources. Okay. Yeah. Uh, excuse me one second. I'm just gonna open that. There we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this chapter covered a lot. Uh, oh yeah. Different, different kinds of nonlinear um, approaches to modeling nonlinear uh, relationships. And um, so last chapter, last chapter we talked. I think we had a couple examples in polynomial regression, if I'm remembering correctly. Although I don't actually remember what um, the context was there, but I know we were talking about it. Um, so there's so that's talked about at the beginning of this chapter. 
Um, and then step functions, regression splines, smoothing splines, local regression, and then generalized additive models. Um, and at the beginning, they, they've included a bunch of resources. Um, and I added this one here, uh, this uh, GAM and R. I think I shared it last time. It's an awesome course. It's like kind of uh, really readable, like like interesting and um, uh, like meant to be uh, kind of enjoyable, I guess. Like, I don't know, it's just written and linked with energy. I don't know how to explain it, but, um, but it's like relatively short and it gives you a good overview of kind of the different capabilities of this uh, MGCV package, uh, you know, uh, using GAMS. Um, has this been, uh, have you pushed this one up yet? I, there's a PR, it's, uh, it hasn't been okay. accepted yet, but, but yeah. Um, no one crossed okay. it, up. okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, um, I thought it was awesome. Like you can get through it in maybe like two or three hours um, of like, and maybe a little bit more. But it's uh, it was really excellent and um, yeah, um, so yeah, and like I guess like a high level thing that I was thinking about during this chapter is, um, and maybe we could talk about this as we get into it more. But could can ever any all of these methods be thought of as like a subset of a generalized additive model? I guess that's an open question for me, but. It seems like some of them can be like they're just kind of special cases of a generalized additive model, and it seemed to me that the new thing that was introduced in that section is like multivariate uh, versions of like these different approaches. You know, like so. Anyway, we can talk about it when we get into games a little bit more, but. I'm just like, what? Well, that's where I'm at right now is trying to yeah, okay. see how they all fit together. Um, because like, in my understanding, like you can use like a polynomial regression function, like within within a, you know, a term in a GAM um, or like multiple terms or like uh, splines, like, it, yeah. So it just seems like those things could just be special cases or subsets of GAMs, but um, uh anyway for me like I, yeah i i didn't quite understand why it's like a whole nother name for for those models um but maybe there's some details there that we can talk about so anyway yeah, I'm, I'm with you at the thing. very sorry go ahead kevin no you go ahead no i was just saying um at the very beginning of the chapter um page 290 uh Last bullet, it says uh, generalized additive models allow us to extend the methods above. So all of the ones you were talking about to deal with multiple predictors. So I think that you are correct in saying that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause it, yeah, cause it seems like multiple predictors and you can make what, you know, those, those functions that model relationships between each of the predictors and your outcome kind of, it seems like anything you want really. Um, right. You know, it could be a polynomial regression with or a polynomial uh, function. It could be, um, you know, and, and then also you can put like interactions within that um, each of those, you know, terms in a GAM and mm -hmm. things like that um, that weren't introduced in the earlier. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, there's background noise. I have a, a six year old that is uh, <laughs> trying to do some uh, some creation of you know, you're almost six. All right. <laughs> um, and he's saying he's not six. All right. So um, anyway, so and then, uh, yeah, so there's and I really like these tidy models versions of, of these exercises as well, but I'll uh, I'll go back to that later. I fixed the link in the pull request too. he changed. The, the syntax on the, his kind of address for these links. So um, a lot of them are broken, but I fixed it there. Um, anyway, so so yeah, so polynomial and stick uh, regression. Um, so we talked about polynomial, I think a bit last time in the lab, um, but yeah, in this case, they're just talking about kind of polynomial with uh, like a single uh, predictor. Um, so this is X I here. Um, and then you just kind of have, um, different terms for 
each degree and different coefficients. Um, yeah, uh, you know, you're estimating a coefficient for every every term. Um, let's see. So this is like an example, I guess, of a polynomial expansion. Um, I guess that thing we talked about last time, I don't know, Ron, you brought up with um, like, if you run, if you, if, if in base R, if you run poly or in tidy models, if you do step poly, were you saying that it creates terms other than these degree, these, you know, just yeah, like it, to the third, fourth, fifth, the, et cetera? It creates, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, I have a bad habit. It creates so, uh, linear combinations of those things that are, that are uh, linearly independent. Um, and that actually, you know, the first thing you do in the lab for this chapter is, is talk, is he goes through that, so. I see, um, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, That's why I brought it up, because, oh, you say, oh, here's how you do with poly, here's poly with raw equals true, here's what you do with the I function, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I just, like, it's confusing to me with that, um, that element of, like, because I feel like that should be represented in these formulas somehow when they're talking about polynomial regression. I agree, um, yeah. But it's a little, it feels like a little hidden. Um, I agree, you're like, oh, if you do the same, oh, just use poly, okay, good. And you're like, oh, wait, if I try right. to do, and then you do a prediction, it all works because you're using the predict function. So it knows how to unfold those polynomials. And, but you say, oh, well, what's B1, beta one? You're like, wait a minute, that's actually not beta one <laughs> in that formula. It's some other big formula. Right, 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 right. Yeah, cool. Okay. So at least we'll get into it a little more once yeah. we get to the lab. Um okay. And then um let's see here. So what are they doing? Okay, so they just have these polynomial fits. Um they're showing um you know this one fit of age on wage. Um and then I guess they do an example where it's a classification. Uh, or they're, I think they, what are they doing? I think they're changing this to, um, this, are they categorizing, you know, doing these cuts? Um, trying to understand what the, they were just showing how to do like a, code a, here. a logistic, a logistic. Oh, logistic. For... Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. I remember that part actually. The chapter. Okay. Um, yeah, and then in, and they're just defining that as wage being above 250. So that would be one above 250, zero below. Um, and yeah, so like the same thing. Okay, so the same thing, except this is a continuous version. This is logistic uh, classification. We'll just- yeah. If I could interrupt, the reason why they wanted to do that is if you look at the data, it looks like there's another group of like high earners that are like separated out. So they wanted to see oh, yeah. what, if there's any predictor on who, why you're in that other group, so to speak. Good call. Yeah, yeah, I hadn't noticed that here. Um, yeah, so this like pretty distinct group up here. Yeah. Nice, thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's. Uh... By the way, did anyone read the P Little Prince, <laughs> the Petit Prince, that book? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. That graph on the right I looks. Mean, that graph on the right looks just like a picture from that book with the <laughs> a snake <laughs> eating something. I forget what the details were. Just like a weird neuron triggered there. <laughs> That's funny. Um, speaking of uh, this this plot here, um, is this uh, is this showing like the density of points observations? Uh, or what it, what are these? Do you know what these vertical uh, lines are? Here? Yeah, that's the class. Okay, that's the data. So you're either in the less than 250 or in the greater than 250. So the the dash the dash lines on the bottom are the data points that are in the less than 250, and then the hash marks on the top are the data points that are in the upper 250 as a function of age. It's the same. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just binary, making that left graph a binary thing, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, okay, okay. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. I think technically they say they it's the ages of high earners and low earners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So what Ron said. Mm -hmm. cool. I just said it in a much more difficult to understand way. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just reading a, a little note that I made. <laughs> but if but just a question about that, then why are they at point two? 
shouldn't they be at one? Like the observed value is one, right? You know, like zero mm -hmm. and one. That's a good question. I have no idea. Oh, I think like it, that 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 dude, that plot doesn't correspond. So the the uh, the values on the y axis are only for reading the plot lines, not for reading the hash marks. I think they just put those arbitrarily uh, arbitrarily at the top. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to read that as point two. Just read that, that at the top. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah, but that's okay. kind of need some need some better graphmanship on that. Huh. Yeah, I guess it's a little that's a little confusing, but we get we get it we get it. Um, all right, thanks, um, thanks for the explanation there. Um, all right, uh, so let's keep going here. Yeah, I'm not going to go through. Oh yeah, so okay, so this is what you're saying. What R does and what is best practice is to force an orthogonal expansion to avoid correlations in the new variables. This behavior is somewhat different than we might have expected, possibly. Uh, we're not really interested in the coefficients, more interested in the fitted value, function values in any value x zero. That's not. Right. Oh yeah, and they talked about this too a little bit in the chapter that at the ends of the kind of like predictor, uh, you know, left and right, like when there's less data, this poly polynomials without other corrections can be can get kind of wild. Um, I think you actually, oh no, this this I think had some kind of smoothing or correction to it potentially. But I remember there were some examples in the book where towards the end of these, uh, you know, the right side of these plots, you could kind of see some wild changes in the trend um, or the fitted, the fit kind of uh, at the at the edge of these um, distributions. So, point there. Um, okay. Um, so they talk about step functions, which is just basically uh, like making um, your predictor uh, uh, discrete. Um, so in this case, it's age. Uh, and they're breaking it to buckets from 0 to 30, 30 to 50, 50 to 70, and 70 and above. Um, and then I believe so. I think the idea here is when you do this and then you run linear regression, R is actually making these into dummy variables for each level. Um, and then you get a different term or a different uh, coefficient for every level of age. Um, and and that, that way you're able to fit, you're able to model like the relationship between age and your outcome at these different, at each level or each category um, in this case. Did I get that right? Sounds right. Um, it's kind of an interesting way to implement it. Like I know in the book they had, you know, it very like written out like in math and it made a lot of sense where they're, you know, just basically saying like, it's kind of like piecewise like functions oh, where it's yeah. like, where it's like if, if it's below a certain value or, if, you know, if it's like greater than zero and less than whatever, like then, um, then uh, uh, then apply this function. If not, then it's just zero. And then, but I guess if you do this cutting, uh, like uh, making it discrete, uh, age discrete, and then running regression, it gives you a term or a new variable for every level. And then, um, which I, I guess has a similar effect. Or, but you know, would be the way to implement it, I guess. Um, all right. Okay. So they note here the choice of cut points or knots can be problematic, um, and they they say that um, in a lot of cases you probably want to use splines um, instead of of doing these like kind of stepwise regression. Uh, uh setups um and you can also do the same thing with polynomials uh instead of just like a linear uh model um, 
Yeah, but in with the, the later examples of splines in general as added models, you can actually use different equations, different functions, uh, different regions. Um, uh, you know, so there's a little bit more flexibility there. Any other points about these? I guess I didn't, I don't know. I don't think polynomials we talked about and the step, wise, step uh, regression isn't that intriguing to me. I don't know. Um, splines and GAMs, I think, were more what I paid attention to. But does anyone Same. have any other, any other points about, about this one, step regression? I'm just going to say that I also took the same kind of approach. Like my eyes kind of glazed over about the step thing. I'm like, I'm not going to ever use this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially like, like you can tell they in this book, they set up a lot of things to show you yeah. something that's better. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you could tell they were really doing that with this. Um, um, it almost seems like you could get away with just the GAMs, right? Yeah. I mean, like I can think of what we were saying before, like, yeah, like mm -hmm. a GAM, you can use splines in GAMs and right, right, right and right. like yeah, you can do pretty much anything. Um so all right, let's just let's go into splines, I guess. Um okay. So a spline is a, a piecewise linear polynomial that's continuous each knot. Um so you can represent this model like so, um, where these B sub Q K, so B1, B2, like lower, uh, kind of lowercase b's, these are all uh, basis functions. So this is some kind of, a, I guess, um, you know, transformation or, or model of the relationship between um, this predictor and your outcome. And each of these basis functions can be, well, I guess in this case, the basis functions are all uh, the same kind of function, um, but they just operate on different kind of uh, like segments of the domain um, of the kind of input, right? So like if you have, um, this is my understanding, but please correct me if I'm wrong. If you have like three, three knots, um, then you'd have one basis function that operates between the beginning of your input or your predictor and that first knot, one that's between that knot and the second knot, between the third and kind of the end of the range of your data, the domain of your data. Um, yeah, uh, and sorry, is that generally right? Are there other people's understanding? So I think you would have a, a basis function for each for each knot. Is that right? Or one one more basis function than there are knots. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So here you have k plus one, where k represents the number of knots, would be the last basis function. Um, okay. Um, and I think uh, let's see. Trying to remember there's a one second. There's kind of some a representation of this that they had in the book that I wanted to bring up. Um, oh yeah, here. So these are the like different kinds of splines, but in each one. Um, uh, okay, so each of these are basis functions. Um, and now I'm forgetting what this part represents. So, so this term here, uh, I guess is included in each of these basis functions. Um, so it's like XI minus, this term and I forget what this term is, but I wanted to talk. Those about are it. the for the knots. So each for each knot, you need an extra mm -hmm. base. So you like you do a cubic. So you have the x x squared plus x cubed as basis functions. Mm -hmm. And this and in this particular approach, then you add on these basis functions for each of the knots that help glue them together. So and some and they say it turns out that this is equivalent to making them continuous and 
mm-hmm, mm-hmm. move the, up the second derivatives at each not location. But I didn't actually work through how that happens. But yeah, some magic okay. trick. <laughs> I did. I did like like have a vague recollection that had something to do with smoothing instead of having this like kind of like these breaks here. Yeah, um, like this. Um, I meant to look up how that works because I'm really curious about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, but I think the basics are like what I said generally is correct, right? With like you have yeah. For each not plus one, you have a basics basis function that's doing some kind of a transformation of your input, and then there's then there's actually a coefficient or a weight on that on that basis output, right? Yeah, uh, like b two, b one, uh, beta one, beta two. Okay. Um, and, and again, I think it's one of these things where you're not really meant to look at the beta ones and beta twos, but rather just Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the predictions you get out of it type thing. right right they're not yeah. interpretable very much i guess yeah like uh like this is actually in the gam course too um where oh okay you this part here where you that he did a lot with like interpretation which i really liked and anyway Ooh. um like uh i think this is kind of what you're saying right that the that when you look at your output you actually want to look at the curves for that are fitted for each relationship between each predictor and your outcome. So in this case, we're still talking about a sig- univariate or you know single predictor, right? Um, but uh, but like this this right here is kind of what you care most about, right? Um, yeah, with with splines and like especially when you have like many predictors or uh, interactions and things like that, um, what you end up like interpreting and looking at is the um, uh you know are these are these fits for each, each right kind the, of the prediction and the, outcome. and the 95 percent confidence they have no intervals on the predictions too mm-hmm. like they're plotting there mm-hmm. hopefully that all becomes clear i only just started the lab so i haven't gotten so far and i don't know if they cover all that but hopefully they do well they do it looks like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah so it says let's see here means the positive part oh i guess Maybe this is oh never mind. I don't know how it smooths. I was just saying, thinking that um, it just kind of it just like excludes any for any values in the like any observations that are not above this not uh yeah location. It includes those parts. Excludes. I mean, sorry. Part. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I still don't know how it helps with like smoothing or you know it looks like exercise one the conceptual exercise goes into that i'm looking at just now it's got one of those yellow uphill cars though so (laughs) (laughs) be what you're warned yeah yeah Um, okay all right all right well maybe for now we can sit in the space where we say you know it (laughs) it it give provides some kind of smoothing or continuity uh, functionality um, in each of these cubic or each of sorry each of these spline basis functions. Um, yeah, and and there's one for every knot that you're uh, however many knots you decide to fit. Yeah. Um, Can I okay. ask a very basic sort of clarification for me? Yeah, go ahead. So go ahead. Yeah. the smoothing mean continuous. And how does you know having continuous first and second derivatives makes a, make a curve smooth? Is it because it's so, differential? So let me take the second half of what you said because uh, I think there's. Uh, sorry, one second. Um, so are you talking about this here? Uh, this. Um, no, I think I know what she's saying. She's saying why does it if you make it obviously you make it continuous, then the two the 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 two segments will join together, right? Mm-hmm. 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 Then you make the first derivative continuous. That means it'll have smooth slope across there, so it won't like have a little uh, kink in it, right? Mm-hmm. Then you okay. then you make the second derivative continuous, and that makes it even smoother across that boundary. And they say anything beyond that, the eye really cannot tell. I don't know what it looks like if you just have a discontinuity in the second derivative. It's not really a kink, right? It's just kind of like a I don't know what it looks like. Oh. I mean, we should have plot that, but um, but you need to at least they make a smooth up the second derivative. Oh, 
or continuous at the second derivative. Okay, okay. So then smooth just means that at least at that point, it's not wildly changing in first or second derivatives? Or, like the or values of it? yeah, right. Okay. Okay. It, I mean, no, I mean, it's not, it's continuous across that boundary. So across the knot, whatever mm -hmm. the, you know, whatever the second derivative was before that knot, the second derivative right after that knot, epsilon on the other side of that knot, it's also the same value. Mm, okay. okay. So maybe, maybe we're kind of mixing up vocabulary here. Like, maybe, yeah. Like making something, would be surprised. Making something <laughs> continuous, I think, yeah. is, is, is separate than, than, uh, than smoothing. Like, this is, I think when we're talking about smoothing, this is what we're the kind of thing we're talking about here, right? Is like putting some constraint on it so that it can't be too jag or too kind of wiggly or too like the slope can't be changing too much um, in the region of the. Yeah, yeah you're right. I, I was mixing it up too. Um, what I've been is smooth in the quotes cross the cross the knot. You know, looks yeah, looks yeah. Smooth, um, across the knot. Where's that? There's a plot in here. It shows you like various two, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, that one that shows like this one piecewise here. cubic, piecewise uh, yeah. continuous piece, you know, yeah, that one, right? right? So in that yeah. first upper left one, it's not even continuous across there, right? On the second yeah. one, it's continuous, but the first derivative is not continuous because it gets a little divot, right? A little thing. Mm -hmm. And then if you make the first derivative continuous, it looks smooth, and you make the second derivative, it's cubic. Explain they call it. So. Oh, okay, 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 okay. That's so what it's I was continuous I, I, plus yeah. smooth. Okay. Yeah. So it's not interchangeable. I guess we have to be careful about the word smooth because it means something special on the second. Right. 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 Okay, okay. <laughs> right. Right. I think yeah. in, in within the text, like that same page, two ninety six, right? Uh, second paragraph. Yeah. Uh, it's the second sentence. So that says, in or, in other words. We are requiring that the piecewise polynomial be not only continuous when age is equal 50, right? But also very smooth. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, okay, okay. I don't know. I feel like they didn't explain why that worked that way or define the terms like very, I don't no, know. No, I don't think they did yeah. either. Okay. They didn't mention some of this that by eye, you can't really see anything. Else. Right, what? right, right. What page was that? Two ninety six, where we were looking at those um, different continuous and or discontinuous. Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. And is this also where they talk about that term? Uh, what is it? Is it? Would you say epsilon? What is that? Uh, um, the one that we were looking at up here. This one. What is this? Yeah. How do you say oh, that? That's a is that a C or something? I don't agree. That's not epsilon, but oh, it's not. Yeah, it does look a little. It has a when I said epsilon, yeah. I was referring to just a small number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this like little like kind of snake uh, tip Greek, here, and yeah. I don't know what that is. Greek letter. I want to say it's a C. I don't know. My Greek. Okay. Kick the kick me out of my fraternity. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. So here they're just saying like we constrain magically the, these things to be true, <laughs> like, uh, but do they actually define that in terms of? Um, I guess they just describe it with language here, right? Yeah, it's it's D, it's Z or Z or they call it X I. Oh, okay, cool. So this is a truncated power basis function. Uh, I can show that adding the term of this form to the model will lead to a discontinuity and only the third derivative. Yeah, that's the one can show, and I guess that's exercise one to get you to more familiar with that. I can't. It makes no sense. It's a mystery to me at this point. Yeah. I mean, I can see there's enough flexibility when you do that. I don't know why bidding with that would actually do the trick, but. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, let me go to this. So, like, I thought this was super interesting as a uh, kind of a making a connection to um, uh, Ridge and Lasso regression. Yeah. Um, like it seems like very much the same idea, right? Like you're you're trying to minimize this entire thing. So you're minimizing the square to error, but then the more uh, wiggly it becomes, right? And the less um, smooth it is. So like the the um, 
yeah, like the greater the change over the span of your data in the slope, um, the more changes you have, the more you're penalized in combination with lambda. Um, and thus it's like gonna give you a kind of a balance between <clears throat> a, 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 you know, something that fits the data really well and something that's not incredibly jagged or, or not incredibly wiggly. Um, yeah. I thought I thought this was like a like a real like some, a lot more intuitive, I think because of the lasso and ridge stuff in the previous chapter. Um, yeah, I don't know. What did you all think of this? I mean, I agree that part's intuitive, but then like, <clears throat> how do you find what is G? G is like some arbitrary function. What is it? And then they, then they they kind of just say, oh no, one can show that G is equivalent to you know splines with every single x mm. point is a knot or something like okay i believe you <laughs> um sorry just to take you back i'm still confused when we say a function is smooth and continuous in the late time what do we mean by that mm -hmm. so i think continuous is just like are there any breaks in the in the in the curves right so here we have like a discontinuity because uh um, but then you can also think about, I think Ron was pointing out in some of these other plots, you can also have discontinuities. And if you take the first derivative, um, you can have a discontinuity in like that higher or that, that derived dimension as well. Um, right. Were, were you saying Ron that this, yeah, this one here. Yeah. Yeah. So if you took a derivative of that green line, you'd have a, another plot that would have a jump in it. A discon a discontinuous discontinuous first derivative so so the so the function yeah. that represents the first derivative of that of that curve uh would have a discontinuity at that point right so if you make the if you make the function continuous and you make its first derivative and its second derivative continuous um then that's what they mean by smooth in the in the first part of the uh uh, this this first part and the second part they mean smooth meaning the second derivative is somehow overall kept under control so it's not wiggly too much right okay. so they have two kind of meanings for smooth in here yeah but i think like visually smoothness is like wiggliness yeah um and like how many kind of like up and down changes do you see across across the curve um yeah so like this this here is more wiggly than than any of the other ones. Yeah. Like, That's okay. what I mean. There's kind of two kinds of smooth. Smooth, smooth. It, I mean, really, if it's discontinuous, it's really not smooth at all, right? So it's like, I guess, but. Then, then, I don't know. Oops, is that me? Sorry. Am I uh, echoey when I talk, by the way? Because I'm not using my headphones. That was, that was me. So, so I was telling, uh, uh, I it was Finn uh, was uh, almost. Yeah, out because. Of these two terms, because I was thinking about um, something that I read about what is called gradient descent, and mm -hmm. what they were saying, like, um, if a function is continuous and smooth and differentiable, then we can find the minima of the function. So these co terms, um, continuous and uh, differentiable, somehow they confuse me. Um, yeah, thank you for the info. But differentiable is just be able to take the derivative, right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I think the same thing for us too. Uh, we're we're like kind of there's a lot of terms that have similar meanings or or you know in different contexts. So anyway, that's why we have a It's good to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. For sure. Sorry, can you go back to the um what was it smoothing splines the last uh, equation that you showed with the with that lambda lambda or, term? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let so me, that did make a lot down. of sense to me yeah. in terms of their explanation, right? But how are you can um, sort of relating this to ridge and lasso just because this functions as a penalty term? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, okay. Because there, but it, but it's also it's like a penalty around uh, that like makes it less likely to overfit, I guess. So like in both cases, it's like a slightly different mechanism for how you reduce yeah. overfitting, yeah. the potential for overfitting. Like in this one, 
it's about like the shape of the like how wiggly you allow it to be and then the bridge right. lasso example it's like how um how uh i guess like how many terms do you allow right? to be yeah right. how many predictors do you allow to be influential or how influential are each of those predictors in your model um, yeah 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 okay so like reducing the the number of parameters i guess yeah um mm -hmm. yeah and i don't know i guess this does something similar right like you're kind of reducing by making it less wiggly like you have to be reducing the number of parameters in some way right or is it just uh flexibility therefore some kind of bias or something i i mean i don't know yeah i mean i would think like you would you would have like less like less degrees of freedom in in a like a more smooth um uh -huh. spline right, right right okay right like i i don't know like i guess what we were saying too is that the mechanism of like what sort of like what this function is and and um i think i think it's hard to talk about if we don't know exactly what yeah, that's true. functions we're talking about with g um, yeah yeah okay um okay um so yeah so they talk about a few different kinds of splines oh. so cubic splines natural cubic splines um and smoothing splines so we did just i think talk about smoothing splines um um yeah and then a cubic spline is a piecewise cubic polynomial with continuous derivatives up to order two at each knot um so let me go back to this these slides here sorry one second cubic splines yeah um so so in this case it seems like with cubic splines you have uh like each knot has a different degreed basis function or there's a different degree to the basis function is that right so like you have the like you have you see again just like the first example we we're looking at with um linear splines you have a basis function for every knot plus one or every kind of interval um and then each one has a higher degree uh, in terms of what you're raising the predictor to is that right it kind of seems like what's happening here I don't I guess I don't quite understand how this how this works like what like what is the value of having um like you know x you know just x x squared x cubed uh for each like region like I don't it's know not for I, each region I know it took me a bit okay. on that too yeah so it's basically b1 b2 and b3 those functions those base functions are for the whole region they're like just a standard cubic and then all these uh, additional cubic terms x minus x z z or what i forgot about z sub k cubed those are for each knot so that's what splits it uh, in the and how that actually turns into being the same thing as the kind of well how that turns into a proper Make, makes everything continuous and continuous derivatives is uh, uh, <laughs> so so not clear to me have, so these three terms and these three basis functions are for the entire range of the data and then yeah and then you have this cubic kind of special with this uh whatever c yeah c correction okay. uh c sub k um and then this is for each each sub region of between the knots yes work oh, i see for one to not. K, for one to k got it got it got it, got it. okay okay and that makes a little bit more sense now like you're not because i was like what kind of like special you know like data are you gonna have to have to like use this because like i was like it doesn't make any sense that you have you know uh you know uh like sing you know first degree like 
term in the first not region second in the second like i was like oh, that doesn't that seems too convenient but um okay that makes a lot more sense thank you yeah yeah so i wasn't reading this part correctly but um okay all right let me go back here okay a uh, natural cubic spline is the last one that we haven't talked about. It says here that it extrapolates linear, linearly beyond the boundary knots. Um, let's see. Um, does anyone have any uh, any uh, intuition about this one? I kind of I thought I had some explanation for why what it what it's covering that these others aren't, but I kind of forget now. Um, anyone want to get a stab at this one? Natural cubic spline. If I remember correctly, it just makes it linear. Like at at the after the you know, for example, there's a like a, there's a final knot, right? Then after that final knot, it requires that just be a line. After that, no more curviness. Oh, okay. So it was this this boundary yeah, issue, or yeah. this 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 end of the range yeah. or domain that we we're talking about. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. That's just to prevent it from wiggling too much, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Extrapolates linearly beyond the boundary knots. Yeah. Okay, so the boundary, so the boundary is the, the last knot. Okay. This adds four extra constraints, allows to put more internal knots for the same degrees of freedom as a regular cubic spline. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I mean, I guess I understand it, but I, there's another figure. Is a do they have that figure on page three hundred one? Because that really shows that like you can see it's actually here. comparing a polynomial, but it has a natural cube. Right. So this is how, this crazy, crazy. Uh, but that's a polynomial boundary. Yeah, yeah. And then the natural the cube nat is right here. Yeah. You can see it's really like a straight line for that last segment there. Mm -hmm. I don't know what makes it. I don't know what makes it natural, but okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe it'll become clear. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's like some. I, I'm just curious how it's actually implemented. Like, how do you how do you make it less less like noisy or less um, you know that like variance at the end of the um, you know like what's the implementation to actually make that happen. Yeah. I think, um, <laughs> I mean, in the lab, you just call smooth dot spline or whatever. Yeah, that's, 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 that's <laughs> right, um, right. I guess it doesn't say whether it's natural or not in the lab. So it just says, I guess the closest we're going to get right now is that it adds some kind of constraints. Oh, yeah. NS. That, Use the that. NS to get a natural spline. So, I mean, the this is typical in this book, right? They're just giving you kind of high level view and they try to give you some feel for how the things work, but I guess you're not expected to be able to implement these things, right? So mm -hmm. you just, you're going to use a function NS in your linear model and it's going to be a natural spline. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess out of the three, I, like I was saying before, this makes the most sense to me. And it's also the most like technical that they got in terms of, yeah. Um, like, like it gives you at least a window into like how that could work, um, how it does this smoothing, which I think is interesting and helpful. Um, but yeah, okay. Um, all right, and then they talk about local regression and this is often abbreviated as like LOIS um, and the way you implement it R is with the function called LOIS. Um, oh. And and actually when I like, if you if you work with ggplot, then, if you work with ggplot and you want to do like a hit of a, a line through your data and you use geom smooth, uh, you can use the lowest method. So you can say method equals lm or method equals lowest um, oh. to get kind of a local uh, regression fit. Um, use ggplot. But anyway, I, I use that a lot just for like understanding the data. Um, but basically, this is just um, fitting a lot of a little like regressions with subsets of the data where, or not subsets, but 
I think each regression is with, in my understanding, is with the entire range of the data, but that the all these different fits have different weights on the different data points. So the stuff that's kind of like um, for however many times you make those fits, uh, the the highest weighted observations are going to be the ones closest to kind of the point that you're fitting around. Um, and then you end up with like, like I guess all these local regressions kind of linked together as, as a single fit. Um, and the span parameter will control, I guess, like how far out you consider data points around each of those fits. Um, so are you like just waiting, just allowing the, the observations close to that point to be uh, considered or are you uh, you know, allowing it, are you expanding it a little bit more? So I guess if it's, if it's a, uh, I would imagine that a, a lower span would give potentially a more wiggly fit. And I think you see that here, right? So like uh, this 0 0.2 span, consider it's like a narrower range for that regression. So you can have a little bit more wiggliness between the different fits because, you, you know, you're you're considering kind of a, a smaller range of data um, and everything else is kind of like weighted out. That's not, you know, within that span. Um, did I get that right? Or is there any anything else uh, here on Lois? What I don't know is like how many times you make this fit um like how many different regression like is it kind of like knots like how how does it know is it is it based just based on the span does it divide it up into like a bunch of segments um you know based on the span somehow like i i don't know how that part of it works you know like how does it does it move through every single data point and apply this span span plus the weighting associated with it, and then maybe that's it. Maybe that's what it's doing. Um, I don't know. Something to look into more. And if anyone else is having a better explanation than I do on that part of it, like intuitively, I feel like this makes sense. Um, you know, so like a lot of local regressions kind of link together, and the span determines uh, for each fit kind of how how many points kind of in either direction you're going to consider in making that fit. Um, I mean, I'll be honest with you for this section and, and maybe a couple other sections in this chapter, all I got out of it was there is a thing called local re regression. It exists. <laughs> yeah, if, yeah, yeah. If someday I have to go beyond that, I'm going to have to do some more research. <laughs> right, right. I mean, what I'm like, what I'm imagining, right, is that like, this is how I could imagine it could be implemented potentially, but this could be totally wrong. That like you're going a, like through age, right? And you're you're starting kind of down here, and you're saying if my span is 0.2, I'm going to consider like uh, like based on the length of my data, maybe I'll consider the next five percent of points or something like that of the total data set. Um, and then I'm going to out like weigh everything else out or kind of maybe the weights degrade as you get further from this first point. And then, um, and then you make that fit. You have a, a you know, a function, uh, you know, linear function uh, based on that with coefficients. And then you move on one point to the right and you do it again and you keep doing that until you're, you have an entire line fit, um, like kind of linked together. That's my, that, that's like my intuition about how it might be working, but. I think that's I mean, right. That's what my intuition is too. I and mean, that's what, from what I read. Yeah. The other, you know, algorithm 7.1, that seems to be what they're saying. If you, you want to predict the value at a point P, it's just like, you know, they said it's similar in structure to the uh, nearest neighbor type thing, right? So you want to pick, I want to predict the value at 51. Then what I do is I take the points within that span near 51, and then I weight them for, the, you know, so the ones that are further away from 51 get less impact and I do a linear fit through there and that's my uh prediction right yeah and I'm guessing there's going to have to be something like what we talked about value, yeah. with with um with with splines where 
you make it continuous, right? Because it's not going to be just like naturally continuous. Those million, those like if you have a hundred linear fits in this range of data, you're going to have to do something to, to make it look a little bit smoother. Well, you, the, the bigger right? the span, the smoother it's going to look. I mean, they demonstrate that right there. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, I mean, like actually like linking it together, like how do you get the two? Oh, neighboring, I don't think there is. There is the two neighboring. Like the two right. neighboring fits to actually connect to each other. No, I don't think you do it that way. I think, yeah, there's no sense in, at each point you make a new fit, at each, every single data point that you want okay. to predict to make a new fit. But this not in the lab, by the way, so I guess this is it. This is our okay. exposure for local regression. <laughs> Let me just, uh, hold on, I just want to zoom in on this plot here. Uh, here. Yeah, I guess we'd have to like really look at a, at like a super zoomed in to see what it looks like between each, you know, each fit. Um, um, Cause like the lines themselves look like, I know that some can be more wiggly or less wiggly depending on the span, but they look like fairly continuous and not like jagged at all. Um, you know, anyway. right, right. Cause right, like if you, if you, true. if you were imagining like two uh -huh. straight lines connecting, right? Like they're gonna be, they're gonna, there's gonna be some kind of like- Oh, I see. Abrupt, no, they're not, you know- abrupt, abrupt angle to it yeah no yeah. you don't connect the lines you don't even use the lines anymore the only thing you use the line you fit for is to predict one value then you you're done with that line then you go to the next one you make a new line and predict one value then you're done with that line you don't that line doesn't appear in this plot in other words oh i see i see uh, okay so it's the right so it's the prediction and then you're linking all of those predicted values and well, plotting line. them here we use those only any point you want to plot you better calculate it and you calculate it using this method that's why I say it's like the nearest neighbor method, right? It's similar in principle. Yeah, yeah. It's a what do they okay. call it? Say it's a a memory has a memory because you have to you have to have all the data to make a prediction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to use keep, keep all the data around to make any prediction because you need to use all the data. Well, at least within the span of where you're going to make the prediction to make a prediction. Got it. Got it. Okay, uh, that helps. Okay, me. wait. One sorry. Then one question: You could potentially have a situation like Kevin is saying where you have discontinuous curves, right? So like where the blue or the, I guess the wigglier one could be discontinuous at at some interval, right? I don't think it would be because you're you are smoothly going across the points because of that weighting function. But I don't mm -hmm. know, like I haven't really put that much thought into it. Or is it like a sliding window thing where you're the gonna sliding window that? thing? Exactly right. Yeah, it's like a sliding okay. window thing. That's a good analogy. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do they call it? Locally, low S stands for locally. Locally estimated scatter plot smoothing. Oh, I, that's, mm -hmm. that's a mouthful. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Let's go to the jams. Yeah. Okay. I think we, Sorry, we, we spent so much time, time on that smoothing, but then they don't even do a lab on it. I think it's never going to come up again. I, I mean, the know. linear I know. local regression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The only reason why I know Lois is from GG, ah. you know, from that GL smooth. Um, That's good to know, actually. That is yeah, how yeah. Lois, yeah. Yeah, anyway, all right. Uh, we'll see how much of this we get through. We have one minute, but uh, maybe we can just chat for a little bit. But um, anyway, so GAMS, right? Generalized added models, basically, we're extending a lot of things we talked about to multiple predictors. Um, and then uh, and each kind of term, right, with your like function and a predictor is, um, is they're added together. So I guess that's, yeah, that's why they're, they're added uh, or it's called additive. Um, yeah. Um, and there can be, Linear, nonlinear, whatever kind of relationship you th see fits for each of these functions that I, in my mind, they're like kind of similar to basis functions. Like I, um, yeah, like, I don't know. It seems like a similar idea. Um, all right. And then it says these terms denote smooth non-parametric functions. Um, uh, Sorry. Um, so, okay, so in this case, right, like you have a natural spline for a year with uh, four degrees of freedom and a natural spline for age with five degrees of freedom plus a term for education. So this is how they're making this fit. 
Um, and so, yeah, this is what I was saying before, like, it seems like just like a multivariate and what you're saying, Sandra, with that, that, uh, that quote that you brought out at the beginning, it's just like a multivariate implementation of polynomial and spline based like models, um, like polynomial regression, spline based and et cetera. And, but you can do it with kind of multiple variables, multiple predictors by, you know, doing them on each predictor individually and then adding together their, uh, their output, um, you know, with, and then you have a beta or a term for each of these, these uh, functions that you're estimating. But like we said before, the actual coefficients are not usually what you care about. Like you end up looking at plots like this, where you consider a single predictor and your outcome, and you look at kind of the fitted, in this case, natural spline between year and, um, and wages. Um, so that's what you see here. Um, then you have- Kevin, so question. Wage so versus if, wages. Go ahead. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So when you said that you're not looking at the coefficients, right, but rather maybe just the shape of the relationship. So then mm -hmm. it's about determining the relationship as opposed to like the strength of the association. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would imagine that, that you might that you might care about like the level of significance, okay. right? But, right. Okay. Uh, but maybe their point is like you don't care as much about the magnitude. Um, of that coefficient, right? But I don't know. I haven't. I haven't worked with these a lot in practice, so in interpreting them. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, but here's like an output, right? So you have. Um, so sorry, I just need to look at what they're fitting here. You have a spline for a year, one for age, and one for education. Mm -hmm. And I think education is categorical, so it becomes like a dummy variable for each level. And you have a, right. just like a, this is just like linear regression here, right? Like what is the effect on wages for getting an advanced degree, um, holding everything else constant? And then, mm -hmm. um, and then you have the smooth terms here, um, and they do have p values. Uh, and I'm not sure what this EDF output is. Uh, I think yeah I don't think I know what that is um but I mean I imagine like you would care like does this is this contributing to the you know the prediction of of wages um right or not right. right and like how like and then but then I think within it like the magnitude might not matter as much as like the I guess what they're saying is it doesn't matter as much as like the um yeah, I don't know. Like, like I guess the yeah because because the the relationship between the predictor and the outcome is going to be able to vary for the range of your predictor depending on the like the level like like if you know over like over here there's like kind of a um you know there's one slope like there can be different slopes the different regions of the um that makes sense yeah of yeah. the domain depending on yeah. Um, but like overall, this model as a whole thing is, mm -hmm. you know, has um, on average some uh, effect on or, or, or association with your outcome. But um, yeah, I don't know. yeah, I don't know if yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. I'm just yeah. trying to talk through. Let's talk through. No, no um, that that makes sense because if you were thinking in terms of like just like a linear regression, right? Um, each predictor is going to get one slope and that determines the strength, but the relationship is always linear. So then you know how to interpret it. But here you have different slopes for one predictor at different ranges, like you were saying. So that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to me, like, the, I mean, um, uh, it's almost like you have like nested predictions mm -hmm. happening. You know, like mm -hmm. you have like, you have like a model within a model and then like you, you, you're, I don't know. It's almost like I know it's not like multi-level, but it kind of seems like a similar idea. Like you're you're having you have a model that is just concerned with this one variable and can be very in predicting this outcome. It can be very, you know, you can make it a spline. It can be very flexible, um, and then that's going to bubble up, and that prediction itself is going to get some sort of a, a weight on average that um, 
or yeah, coefficient that that um, you know uh, reduces the error in predicting the outcome. Um, you know, relative like considering all of these other kind of nested models that you're fitting. Um, right. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. But they do talk about like, so one thing they say about them, I've seen a bunch like here and also um, in that course is that they hear like this basic statement right here, I think summarizes as well. Like they strike a nice balance between interpretable yet biased linear model and the extremely flexible black box learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. So like, mm -hmm. so like you get, so I guess like each coefficient is interpretable, but, but like, you know, and like you can assess like how, you know, if that term matters uh, for your outcome, but um, uh, so like, but like in a, in a way that like a, you know, like, a, like a more flexible non-parametric model, like a machine learning, like, like deep learning model or like a tree-based model or something, like you're not going to be able to have that nice like term by term um, assessment of like, of like, uh, what kind of matters for predicting your outcome. Um, but then it also still has that incredible flexibility with, you know, getting as wiggly as you want it to be, you know, for each kind of bivariate relationship or even like interactions as well. Um, right, right. Yeah. Um, yes, I think we are doing our, bring our own questions next week, Ron. Um, and I think that the interesting thing here too is this part as well. So like some of these functions can be like, if you know that there's a linear relationship between age and wages, but there's a non-linear relationship between um, uh, education level or something and wages, then you can fit two different uh, types of functions on each of those variables and use them both in a single model. Um, which is, I think, really cool. Um, and you don't really see too many other models that we've talked about or any really up to this point that can do that kind of thing. You know, usually it's like you either have a um, uh, really constrained like linear model or uh, like a polynomial model, but you don't really see a lot with like mixing these different types of approaches. But this has like, you know, you can really pretty much like do a spline, a, a, a polynomial function, like regression, like, uh, you know, pretty much any of these, um, you know, for each term. So anyway, it, se it seems to me like, like the, the most interesting part of this chapter. Um, and I still stand by, yeah, that, that idea or that like kind of the impression I'm coming away with that, like it basically, like I think each of these can be thought of as like a special constrained case of a GAN. Sorry, I'm keeping boxes of what you just said because that's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I haven't seen anything that that disputes that, that idea. So feels I don't know feels right or consistent with what they're saying. Um. I have, a, I have a question then. So if, you know, GAMS can do pretty much what all of the other ones do, when would you, would you ever have a case where fitting, you know, like a super flexible, or maybe less flexible polynomial outperform like a generalized additive model? So I guess what I'm saying is why not just always use this mm -hmm. GAM and never yeah. bother with polynomial regression, for example? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I guess what I'm thinking is that, like, you could do polynomial aggression within a GAM context. Like, you could say, like, mm -hmm. couldn't you just say, like, poly on one of these terms and give it a degree? And then, and then, um, right. instead of like a, a spline, and then, um, and then, like, for that predictor, you would have all these polynomial terms within that, the single you know, this, like this single function that is, you know, fitting on that variable, you have a bunch of terms that it's fitting and then, and then you get a coefficient um, on that output, like, just like you are with this spline here. Right, um, right, right. 
I wonder so to me, if, I don't know. Like, it's not like an either or in my mind, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, it's, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you could just do it. You could do polynomial regression within the GAM context. Yeah, because I'm thinking, you know how uh, Ron brought this up last time when we were doing uh, just the, the linear regression, right? That you can have polynomial fits. Generally, um, I guess they were maybe low degree, so you're not getting up to like 15 degree polynomials, right? Um, but that's still within just linear regression, right? Whereas these are like models that are not necessarily linear. And so I'm wondering, you know, like how the polynomials here compare to polynomial fits in just linear regression, or is it just like the fact that these are more flexible overall? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I, I'm not getting like, you know, how you can categorize polynomial fits in linear and also non-linear like mm -hmm. modeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess like, they're yeah. still linear in the coefficient. I guess the thing is they're still linear in the coefficient. So I mean, even though the functions are mm, the base, right. they still have a linear right. combination of basis functions. Those individual basis functions are not lines anymore. They could be other mm -hmm. things, but mm -hmm. that's kind of the idea I thought. Okay. Okay. I guess that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Well, like, uh, but I guess if you if you fit like a polynomial regression on its own, right, and then you mm -hmm. did the same thing, but you put it in a gam. Those two right. would be equivalent if the coefficient was just one, or if it was, I'm trying to imagine how those right. two scenarios are, can be the same. I think if, right. if the beta on that polynomial function within a gam is one, maybe, I don't know. I would have to think about that. Uh, and then you have a separate like, intercept in this gam model. Yeah. Right, right, right. So and maybe I'm wrong, but so for the polynomial fit, right, you're fitting over the entire range of the predictor X, right? Whereas for all of these GAMs and, you know, like stepwise things, you're always fitting over a smaller range. So you split up the range uh, of the predictor, right? And so I, I wonder if just fitting over the full range, like say some sort of flexible polynomial gives you some sort of benefit in terms of like either variance, right? Yeah, yeah. Or or bias such that it could produce a better fit than you know making all of these like, I mean I guess you could tweak the gam such that you know it doesn't overfit anywhere, and to get like the same, whatever RSS as just a polynomial fit over the entire range. But I'm just wondering like in general, would there is there some kind of benefit to fitting? like yeah. one polynomial function over the entire range as opposed to fitting several things over little pieces. So so one, I don't know. Yeah. one clarification I think I or thought I have just based on what you said is so, so like mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessarily true that you're fitting each of these so each term in a GAM isn't necessarily on a subset of the data it could be on the entire set of the data depending mm -hmm. on what your mm -hmm. function is that you're using so a spline mm -hmm. in this case right will will fit it in this case with five knots right so it's like considering a bunch of you know different relationships like a different from those intervals you know between yeah. the knots yeah, you're right. but yeah but like here education is just like a a, a regular term like it is in like linear regression and mm -hmm. that that is just fit like as 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 it would be like similarly i would imagine in like a linear regression model right so like right. you have just an estimate on that actual observed value for education um that makes sense so like i think like yeah uh, yeah yeah depending on what you choose to as your function that you're wrapping around each of the predictors in a gam mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. it could be fitting within that function could be fitting on the entire data at once or it could be fitting on pieces of it um so yeah so i think like and then yeah. I, I go back yeah. to that idea about like the stuff about gam how gams and splines and polynomial regression can fit together like i think like splines are where you have those kind of local or like lowest or whatever those like kind of local fits a bunch of local fits kind of stitched together um and then a gam can use that plus any other approach in making a, a model or prediction, you know, um, and right. it kind of adds all of those different outputs together linearly. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, so and I, I think so I, I was just, 
forgetting that, um, for example, in the polynomial fit, I think they're talking about one predictor at a time. And then with a gam, like, like you said at the very beginning is where you can add, you, you can extend to multiple mm -hmm. predictors. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like I would, yeah. Yeah, like I would imagine if you, if one of these, instead of doing spline was a polynomial regression fit, if it's possible, like if you can do that within a gam, I'm not even sure, but I'm just assuming you mm -hmm. can, um, that that actual fit here would be with, for, for a polynomial regression would be within, would be the entire, over the entire data. Um, but it would just have like all those polynomial terms um, within the, within the fit, right? And then like, but then the output would just be, would be given its own, um, the output of that polynomial regression would be given its own weight relative to all the other things you're doing in the model, plus an intercept for the GAM. Um, right, 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 right. I'm, you know, I'm wondering, cause the very, um, let me just check actually. So I'm try trying to compare the polynomial, the four degree polynomial fit, uh, of wage and age, right, to the gam fit for the same predictor. And I mean, it seems like it looks fairly similar. Sorry, I did, I did check and I did check and you can use poly inside a gam as well, if you wanted to just do a normal polynomial for one of those variables. Okay. Yeah, because here they're they're kind of like they're huh. hitting like like polynomial regression against GAMs, and they're like, well, like you can use like these these splines like that are kind of these local fits, you know, penalized splines, a range of penalized splines rather than a global fit for poly. But yeah, but, I, but yeah, okay, that makes it makes sense if you could do a polynomial fit within a GAM, because like why not? You can do any sort of you know function that transforms that input you know a spline whatever it is um to try to predict what you're trying to predict you know like it doesn't seem like there's anything special about gams and splines that make them work relatively well together like they just it just is something that fits within the gam framework so. yeah can i quickly show my screen yeah go ahead yeah yeah, yeah. i was trying to to compare let me see uh, hold on one second um, share screen Okay, I think uh, Kevin, you need to stop sharing. Okay. All right, there you go. Kevin, you're oversharing. <laughs> <laughs> you overshare. <laughs> that was my role. That was my role today. Right. <laughs> so, okay, so here is at the very beginning, right? The degree four polynomial fit of age on wage, right? And then here in figure 711, this middle panel is the same, whatever fit they did using the GAM, right? And so I'm like, what fits the data better? Um, mm -hmm. It almost seems, and it, but I could be wrong because it's just eyeballing it, right? That the four degree polynomial models, um, like I feel like this GAM seems to be influenced by the, this group of you know, wage earners over 250, which is a small proportion of the, of the data points. So mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, oh, that's interesting. Do you actually have the gam how it's formulated for that? Um, is that in there? Like the actual it, syntax of it? Yeah. Oh. No, I think they just say like, let me see. F2 age, whatever F2 they've decided. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, you're totally right in that bit though. I mean, that's like really chasing those. Um those uh yeah those observations it seems kind of way up in the um yeah but you know again you know this is just me eyeballing it and i'm sure you know there's much more mm -hmm. mathematical ways of determining this and so um because I guess then say that you notice this, right, in your data, and this was the case, right, that uh, your a four degree polynomial fits it better, then you can just, for this predictor, fit mm -hmm. this within your GAM that has all of your other predictors. And so they're yeah. fitting a linear one for a year, and then you could fit a four degree polynomial. And it's, I forget what they fit for this one. Um, oh, it's just like levels, right? So, sorry, one, one thing, though, is that... Mm -hmm. um, 
the the y axis is different in each of these. Yeah, but okay, so yeah. So like I think I think like each 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 in a gam I think each each plot that's showing the fit of like uh -huh. that that variable you know that that predictor on your outcome and you, whatever that uh -huh. approach is to fit fitting it seems like in this one it might have been like a a spline or something. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. That that I think it's it's showing you that like with with um like it's controlling or holding all the other terms in your model constant, right? So I think it's actually, I'm not sure what the consequences are of that though um, on the range of your outcome there because you have the like, negative values, right? And that it's like wages, right? So it's like, it says like negative 60, negative 40, negative 30, right? Yeah, so it's, okay. Would it be correct to say that it's some sort of, well, it's th that F2 function, right? Applied to the... Um age oh wait sorry that's age and age i'm sorry that's not even wage never mind that's totally different then. no but it's it's the it's the function of it's like the the output of the function that you're fitting where age oh is got the it input. yeah that's, that's so, true so yeah, yeah, yeah i think it is i think it is wages but it's like some kind of controlled or like uh i don't know i don't know if it like is fitting all the other terms and then and then like subtracting out their predictions or something like that, or, or from mm. like from the, the actual observed outcome and then showing you just age and like the leftover residual on wages or something like, something like that. Um, oh, okay, okay. I would have to look, look into that how, it, how, how that actually works. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, what does it mean to hold all your other terms constant when each of your other terms is like some complex nonlinear okay. model mm -hmm. uh, or nonlinear relationship. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. I need I need to look a little more in games. I need to review that course again that I shared. The, the one moment. that you just uh, gave us. Yeah, that Noam Ross one. Um, yeah, there's a section on interpreting and visualizing Gams. Mm -hmm. um, um, game outputs. That's interesting. Yeah, never mind. Sorry if that was more confusing than useful. Um, no, I need to review those those plots. No, it makes me realize I need to look at that again. Um, but. I, but from what you showed though, it does seem like it's it's a like there's something adjustment happening, right? Like that right, right. Is, is holding everything else in the model constant. And I'm not whether that's taking all those influences and subtracting them out of the outcome and then showing you how age fits to you know the outcome using a spline like. That you know the res just like the residual outcome. I, I don't know, but mm -hmm. yeah, but maybe we can look into it and we can all <laughs> write about it in the chat or something. Um, but yeah, when I read through this chapter, I was like, I was like, this is. I, I think I get it. And then talking through it, it was like very difficult. <laughs> and, um, it's a, this is a and, challenging chapter, and I think you did a great job. <laughs> yes, you did. Thanks. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, it was awesome discussion. I, I, I enjoyed that. Um, I, I just like, I think like the the promise of GAMS and like how they, how no, no Ross also frames it in that, in that course is like that whole point and that also in the notes about like interpretability plus flexibility, like in a way that you don't quite see in those kind of combinations in many other models. It's really intriguing. I just need more practice with that you know, interpretation and kind of uh, how to interpret some of those relationships, like those plots. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully the lab will help with that. Um, I have the term partial, confused. yeah, I have the term partial dependence floating in my head. Like, partial dependence. is that, is that what I was describing where like you, you're looking at the relationship between uh, some predictor and outcome where you've kind of, regressed out the the variation associated with some other predictor hmm. 
That's a good name for a partial dependence because like when you do a partial derivative, you hold all the other variables constant and you take the derivative with respect to that one const the one parameter. So a partial dependence means holding all the other ones constant. What's the dependence on this one? Yeah. Mm. I think it's like something like that. That's a good but... term. If it's not the term, quickly <laughs> coin it. <laughs> I, there is though. I'm, I'm Googling right now partial dependence. Um, uh, let me see if it actually does line up with what I show in GAMS. Shows the dependence between the target response and a set of input features of interest, marginalizing, uh, marginalizing over the values of other, all other uh, input features. It's interesting. Yeah, I think, that I I think they are partial dependence plots. I yeah. just searched inside the book for the word partial dependence, and it's introduced in the next chapter for some reason on tree based methods. <laughs> oh. oh, interesting. Okay. But there is like something I'm seeing at ResearchGate where they're like showing these plots that like the ones we were looking at for GAMs, and then it says GAM partial dependence plot. So maybe it is something similar. Um, well, no, I mean, the way they define it in, the, in on page 360 would apply also to the GAMs. Mm -hmm. Seems to me. Says, yeah, partial dependence plot for logistic type model. It's constructed by set. This is just for a stack overflow answer, but it's constructed by setting all but one feature to fixed static values and varying the remaining feature through a range. Yeah. Uh, I have a question then. So when you hold, right, like uh, in that. Uh, figure 711, the last one that we were looking at for the GAMS, everything constant and just look at one predictor, is that the same as just fitting uh, regression for the one predictor? Or is is it mathematically mm -hmm. different? Yeah, my thought is that it's different just because of the range of that outcome that we're looking at. Because mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not the raw like scale anymore. Right. Um, so it ha I think it has to be something like I think if 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 that was the only term in the model, that spline, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. it would be the same as that that as that um, polynomial plot. Right. Right. I okay. would think, or like the the range would be the same. I mean, I don't know if the fit would be the same, but or similar, or like it would still have that thing you were talking about with like the. It seems like the curve chasing those higher points, but, mm -hmm. but maybe I don't know. But but like if it's right that it's like kind of a partial dependence type plot, then maybe or there's something or it's something like what I was saying about fitting all the other terms and then just looking at whatever's left over. Um, maybe those other terms predict the stuff at the bottom really well, and like the stuff at the top is what's left over. I don't know. Um, now I'm just getting like super, oh. like, I'm just like throwing around random thoughts. But anyway, yeah, well, let's, we should look up like, uh, yeah, GAMs and see what those plots are actually showing us in a little bit more detail. But do you anyway, plan to look I, at that course? You yeah. Need. Yeah, yeah. I, I need to review it again. I like looked at it and I was like, damn, I forgot a lot of what I did in the course. <laughs> um, so I need to, I need to read it again. Um, but yeah, it's super good. Um, and it's an R. Yeah. So. Oh, good. Um, and it's all with this, uh, yeah, uh, I guess this uh, GMC or GM, sorry, M MGCV package. Um, so it's it's basically that plus anything in base R. So everything else, plotting all that stuff in base R. Hmm. So, but really good. So. All right, well, I gotta run. Uh, good job. Learned Thank a lot. You. Yeah. Um, thanks, Kevin. Look forward, look forward to you. going over the labs and uh, mm -hmm. I only just barely started them, so I'll dig through them and next week we could talk about those in the exercise. You're always so, first, Ron. You're so, um, I'm, like, I'm always trailing behind all the labs and you're like, has anyone done number five? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, to be honest, I've only just started doing the labs. I got through the first part, so that's about it. <laughs> well, sounds good. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bye. Bye. Bye.